Hi, Jeff Spira here. And today I wanna to talk to you about an interesting set of circumstances um, that took place about 200 years before uh, Columbus. So um, there was a group of Africans um, from the kingdom of Mali. You know, at that time, Mali was substantially larger than it is today. Now Mali is a fairly small country and it's landlocked, and but it's surrounded by a, a you know, number of uh, other West African nations like uh, like uh, Senegal, Burkina Faso, Guinea, Sierra Leone, Mauritania, and Cote d'Ivoire, which is the Ivory Coast, and Liberia. But back in the 1300s, it was it was included most of those countries and was a economic and cultural and educational powerhouse in West Africa. Well, there was a magician named uh, Sunjata, who was, was a legendary figure in, in uh, West African history. He founded Mali. You know, he seized the gold of uh, the gold regions in early 1200s and introduced cotton cultivation and weaving to the nation. So um, a little bit later, a, a person named Sun, Sundiata Keita um, seized much of that new land, uh, including the, uh, the kingdom of Timbuktu, the city, I'm sorry, the city of Timbuktu, which was in Mali. And it was situated on uh, rest, West Africa's most important trade route, which is the Niger River. And um, it was also part of the gold producing area of Bure. Well, but during Sun, Sundiata's reign, uh, Timbuktu became not only prosperous, but it was a center of learning. So uh, scholars, poets, and artists from all over Africa um, came there. And for the next 200 years, Mali became the wealthiest and most scientifically advanced nation in Africa. Um, much of the history of Africa, you know, and in general, and in and Mali specifically, is, is kept by what are called griots. They're verbal historians who memorize historical event descriptions and then are able to recant them in long song-like chants. These are often passed down from father to son, you know, over very, very strictly taught uh, over long periods of time to ensure the integrity of the information is maintained. The chant of the griot is how Alex Haley was able to locate his African ancestor uh, for his now famous work, Roots, where he found Kunta Kinte. But that was through the, the voice of a griot that was shown on the, in the movie as well. So Sundatia's nephew was named uh, Mansa Abu Bakar II, and he ascended to the throne in the early 1300s. Um, he was an educated and curious man, and in 1311, he sent a flotilla of 300, I'm sorry, 200 ships packed with men, gold, and enough water and provisions to last for years to explore the limits of the ocean. So several months later, a single ship returned, um, and he questioned the captain, and when he explained how the ships kind of discovered a river at sea and took off at a rapid pace, so he became fearful. So he um, he he turned turned around and sailed home. So you know, this kind of fascinated uh, Abu Bakr, wondering where the rest of the ships had eventually landed. So he ended up uh, assembling a flotilla of even larger of two thousand ships, half of them dedicated to carrying only provisions. So this was a this was a big group, um, and and uh, so he appointed his brother. Mansa Musa as king and took command of the of the expedition personally. Um, Mansa Musa was one of Mali's most famous and wealthiest kings. You know, he he reigned from 1312 to 1337 and was uh, responsible for building a lot of mosques and universities and libraries, many of which still remain today. So, um, but. Uh, uh, Abu Bakr uh, abdicated his throne, uh, and even to the you know, to pursue the noble quest of seeking new knowledge. But it was considered shameful. So many griots, when they learned the story and passed it along to their descendants, refused to cite these events in public. So you know the the griots really they taught 
two, there were two things that they taught. One was the real story, and the second one was the story that they were only allowed to speak uh, publicly. So um, now these stories are coming to light uh, as modern historians and, and researchers are coaching these, co coaxing these out of people still steeped in the original tradition. So many stories uh, lead credence to them being historical records as opposed to fanciful meanings of fiction. So these are these stories are real. Um, Mansa Musa had been note, the noted personality told the tale of his brother and to many noble people of the era. In one of his trips to the holy city of Mecca, they, they were, uh, uh, they were uh, Islamic, you know, he befriended a famous Syrian scholar named Al-Umari, who later recorded this conversation. And, and, and uh, Mansa Musa told about his brother Abu Bakr equipping ships um, and uh, they departed a long time past before anyone came back and then one ship returned and he asked the captain what news they brought and he said yes O sultan we traveled uh, for a long time and there appeared in the open sea a river with a powerful current the other ships went on ahead but when they reached that place he did not return and no more was seen of them as for me i went about at once and did not enter the river so this was the solo ship that returned. Uh, the Sultan got ready 2,000 ships, 1,000 for himself and the men whom he took, and 1,000 for water and provisions. He left me to deputize for him and embark on the Atlantic Ocean with his men. That was the last we saw of him and to all of those who were with him. And so I became king of my own right. That was uh, his brother. So. Um, so what became of those thousand ships? Did they reach the coast of Americas? The evidence, evidence seems to point to just that. One of the most compelling pieces of hard evidence is a gold alloy spearheads brought back to Spain by Columbus. Uh, the natives of Hispaniola called the metal quanin. They were assayed at Spain and found to be an alloy of gold, silver, and copper, identical to an alloy being forged in Guinea as part of the Mali Empire was at that time. They've been analyzed in modern times and found to contain a metal of West African origin. So the natives of Hispaniola also brought out woven cotton handkerchiefs in bright colors. Um, Bartolome de la Casas was the editor of, of Columbus's published journal. Quotes Columbus is saying, the Indians brought handkerchiefs of cotton very symmetrically woven and worked in colors like those brought from Guinea, from the rivers of Sierra Leone. So it's fascinating that the only woven fabrics uh, found in the Americas when Columbus arrived were of a fiber, a style, and colors and configuration identical to African products at the time. Columbus himself thought the natives were Mohammedans, as he wrote in the journal of his second voyage of their deadly uh, dietary regimen nearly identical to the Muslims he'd encountered in his travels. So in 1498, in Columbus's journal of his third voyage, he wrote, uh, canoes had been found which from the start of the Guinea and navigate to the west with merchandise. Um, again, in 1499, Columbus describes West African traders in what is now the coast of Panama. In 1502, Columbus makes his fourth trip to America and lands on the coast of Honduras. Um, Ferdinand Columbus, who was Columbus, Christopher Columbus's son, uh, wrote that his father described a meeting men very dark, almost black in color, living in that area. It was a tribe of people known as the Almane, Almane, living in that region at the time. In Mandinga, the prominent language of, the, of, of Mali, as well as in Arabic, Al Imamu refers to members of the Al Imam. Muslim community. So the Al-Mame and Al-Mimam um, Muslim community seem to, seem to have a lot, of, a lot in common. So uh, in 1502, Columbus came across a ship with strange peoples near uh, Jamaica. The ship was 40 feet long and eight feet in beam, and it contained a shaded shelter in the center. Uh, Columbus was obviously a well-traveled and experienced sailor. He thought it was a Moorish galley, similar to those he'd seen in the Mediterranean. 
Historians had always assumed these were Mayan Indians, but there's no records of Mayans having any ships at all. The ship Columbus saw also contained a copper forge, definitely not a Mayan artifact. The several dozen people aboard wore colorful clothing, also not Mayan, and the women on the ship covered their faces. According to Columbus, the clothing and covered faces looked remarkably like the people of Grenada, Spain. At one time, the center of the Moorish, which were the Muslim people living in Spain at the time of the Inquisition. Um, Ferdinand Balboa, who was a Spanish explorer, when he arrived in Panama in 1532, wrote that he was surprised to see many tall black men with distinctive hair and facial features, typical of Africans, fighting against them in the battles. The Native Americans did not know the origins of these people. Um, in 1975, two distinctly African skeletons were un unearthed by the Smithsonian Institute um, in the U.S. Virgin Islands. The soil the skeletons were buried in was carbon dated to about 1250 A.D., well before Columbus, and within the standard margin of error, it could have been about Mansu Abu Bakr's voyage. So there were a number of tribes living uh, in the uh, America when the European uh, settlers arrived who were of African origin. They included the Washita people in the Louisiana Territory, the Black Jami Jamasi of Georgia, South Carolina and Alabama, and Black Californians. After European settlers took over the native islands, the practice of slavery was introduced and many dark people were collected and sold into slavery without concern for their origins and property rights. And they had their you know, collective memories systematically erased. You know, reading, writing, and verbal education uh, was dealt with harshly. So the bulk of the knowledge of these cultures is gone forever because the, the people didn't, uh, pat, were, weren't able to pass that on to their children. Um, some sense of uh, cultural identity and history was passed on, though whispered in the dark at night between parents and children. Some members managed to escape slavery, so portions of the Washita verbal histories include their ancestors' connections with Africa and uh, connate, uh, contain intimate knowledge of African seafaring and navigation. Now, West Africa is a land dominated by water. You know, commerce and trade is uh, performed along water routes. The Niger, Senegal, Volta, and Gambia rivers have been and even are today responsible for nearly all the transportation of people and goods in the area. This means West Africans are boat people. They're skilled at boat building and handling. Their vessels are equipped with sails, oars, and efficient steering systems. The majority of the boats plying the, Meyer, uh, the Niger River are dugout canoes. These range in size from small one-man personal craft to vessels over 80 feet long and capable of carrying 100 men. Specialized craftsmen build these uh, canoes far inland where huge trees grow in uh, heavily forested areas. So they're hollowed out in the traditional manner using the fire to burn the core out of the log and leaving a one piece watertight hull as shell as the hull. So the Niger rivers are fast, seaworthy and maneuverable. Vessels far smaller and less seaworthy have on many occasions across the Atlantic. So there's little doubt that the West Africans had the capability to build and sail such vessels across the Atlantic, especially when the expedition was uh, said to have people and provisions spread out on numerous uh, vessels. So the loss of one or even a percentage of the flotilla would not mean a failure of the expedition to arrive in America from the far shores. So. Well, the North African, Egyptian, and East African knowledge of astronomy and celestial navigation skills have been studied in great deal of detail and have long understood. Sub-Saharan and West African knowledge of these practices have largely been ignored. Dr. Jarita Holbrook, a research scientist uh, and professor at the University of Arizona, is making great strides in understanding traditional uh, and historical knowledge of the heavens and its correlation with the customs and traditions of West African peoples. Since around 400 AD, many West African peoples have oriented their homes so that the cross beams align with the summer and winter solstices. 
Um, in addition, over 1,600 stone circles have been identified in parts of West Africa. While full analysis uh, is yet to be completed, uh, preliminary inspection indicates these are very similar to well-analyzed stone circles in East Africa, known as Namorotunga II, now positively identified as astronomical uh, uh, calendars. So the uh, uh, West Africans had knowledge of how to use navigational tools to determine their position on Earth. So uh, in addition to the homegrown astronomical knowledge, uh, Mansa Abu Bakar's time, the, the nation of Mali was, as I had mentioned earlier, pre predominantly Muslim, meaning that the knowledge of the region had been imported from the Middle East where, uh, where Islam originated. You know, it's not practical to assume that the original religion came over a few bands of traders over the you know, caravan across the Sahara Desert, but it must have come by sea. By uh, Mansa Abu Bakr's time, there was a co healthy coastwise sea commerce uh, with known routes, navigational charts, and marine compasses in use. So knowledge of seafaring and oceanic uh, uh, navigation were certainly available in Mali at the time when the king set sail on his, on his expedition. Um, perhaps the most famous navigator and cartographer of the Middle Ages was Abu Bakr, I'm sorry, Abu Abdullah Muhammad Ibn al-Sharif al-Idrisi. He was born in Spain in 15, 1154 AD. Al-Idrisi sailed throughout the, um, the Mediterranean taking careful measurements and he ventured uh, into the Atlantic sailing up the coast of Western Europe and down the coast of Africa. Al-Idrisi, like most mu Muslim scientists of the era knew the earth was a sphere and, uh, and he was very adept at spherical trigonometry and astronomical observations. He was able to calculate this, the circumference of the Earth as 22,900 miles. You know, his, his calculation was remarkably accurate since it's only about 9% off the actual value. Aristophanes um, missed that calculation, uh, you know, 900 years before by 10% by on the high side. And, uh, Al Idrisi missed it by 9% on the low side. So uh, anyway, Al Idrisi constru uh, constructed some beautiful and functional globes of silver weighing 400 pounds for the, for, uh, the Norman King, Roger II of Gusard, Sicily. Um, he was another great benefactor of the sciences, sciences at that time. Roger was delighted and commissioned Al Idrisi to compile a great atlas of the, all the known lands, complete with precise descriptions and locations, using one of the first time they used a coordinate system like latitude and longitude, complete with routes and distances in between them. <clears throat> this massive project to, took Al Idrisi 15 years to complete. Okay, well, that's uh, the story of uh, the possible uh, introduction of Africans and West Africans into America 200 years before Columbus. Um, again, a lot of, lot of uh, information there. And it could be some amazing voyages if, uh, if, if that, um, those, those facts can be uncovered in, in more depth. But uh, there's just, it seems to be a lot of information there. And it, uh, um, I, I, would, I would highly doubt that those, those events didn't happen. So um, anyway, that's my story of, uh, of, of the Africans in 1312 coming to America. And uh, hope you enjoyed and we'll talk to you again soon.